So, Joe, you were asking me about Anapanasati and um, the basically what we're what we're, you're asking about is the distinction between the formal organized complete presentation as opposed to the functional normal successful way of practice all right it's almost the distinction between a phd dissertation and uh, a to-do list and that uh, Anapanasati as a complete practice uh, works with all of the 16 stage, or excuse me, the four foundations of mindfulness. And that each one of them is broken into four little groups. And that gives the entire 16 steps of Anapanasati. And that seems for many students, especially beginners, kind of daunting. The other problem with that is, is that when it's taught in a formalized way, that just like any book, you've got to have a chapter one and then a chapter two and then a chapter three that things go in that kind of linear progression. OK, and so because uh, Anapanasati is practiced for the fulfillment of the uh, uh, Satipatthana, then it's natural for the Anapanasati Sutta to be laid out in that order of the, the normal order of the, uh, the Satipatthana, which if you think about it from the perspective of temperature, it has some value in the sense that solid things. Uh, the Satipatthana, by the way, in the time of the Buddha, he used the Satipatthana to uh, talk about the body, the ways that the people at that time talked about the whole world, the reality. And that uh, now that we, uh, in chemistry, we have 92 plus um, elements in the time uh, of ancient times all over the world, they had four. They had four in China, they had four in Tibet, they had four in Thailand, they had four in Greece. What are the four? Solid things, liquid things, gaseous things, and fire. Now we also recognize that that is a reference to temperature. When things are cold, they're solid. You can get even hydrogen cold enough to be solid. You can also get hydrogen just cold enough to be a liquid. Normally, it's a gas, but if you get it really hot, it'll become a fire. That in fact, if you get really, really super hot, then it's going to be a plasma, and in the plasma state, the actual um, molecules, uh, let us say the hydrogen atom, is separated from the electron completely. And then it's not even hydrogen anymore because it's too hot to even maintain uh, its atomic structure. And so this old method of looking at the world of solid things, liquid things, gaseous things and fire things, the Buddha took those four elements and put it into the body, the Satipatthana. And so Anapanasati is the actual practice that the Buddha gives for the fulfillment of the Satipatthana. And that if each one of these four elements of the Satipatthana are broken down into four groups, that kind of begins to make it complicated until you understand why the groupings are there. And one of the ways of looking at the groupings is to divide each of the Satipatthana elements into two groups. And that we can practice it that way into two groups. For instance, in the body, you have the first two groups are going to be mindfully breathing in long and mindfully breathing out long, and then mindfully breathing in short and mindfully breathing out short. And we don't even have to define short other than that it's not long, but it's still breathing. Okay, and mindfully breathing that. 
And then the second half of the uh, uh, that part of the Satipatthana is to have knowledge and understanding of the body and to relax the body. So we start with the breathing first, and then we use the breathing for the understanding of the body and then the relaxation of the body. We also can see that with um, the, the Vedana, that the lower part of the Vedana is the, the skill of uh, Sukha and Pity, and then uh, the more advanced step um, uh, seven and eight are going to be the seeing how the influences are that the mind influences the feelings and the feelings influence the mind and also we can see that we can actually um pacify these feelings to settle them down in the mind then we have the beginning process of examining the mind and brightening the mind on the first part of it and then in the later development we see the collection of the mind and the liberation of the mind and this is step number 10 and 11 like that and then in the fourth tetrad we see uh it's starting with step 13 and 14 of seeing the arising and the falling away of everything and then in the step 15 and 16 later we see the rotting the deadness and the relinquishment of letting it go, throwing it out, okay? So each one of these four foundations of mindfulness in the Satipatthana has work for the beginner and work for the intermediate. And so, um, or for the adept. So the beginner now is the question of, well, what are we going to give the beginner? Because if we give him all 16 stages, that's just too much. That we need to actually concentrate on, well, if we've got it already divided into beginner and advanced, then we've already got them down to about eight anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. For the beginner. So let's look at which ones of the eight are the most valuable. And we can see then that uh, the starting of the practice in according to the Eightfold Noble Path, we have to keep putting the Eightfold Noble Path into whatever meditation practice that we're having. If we miss the actual Eightfold Noble Path and just go practice meditation somehow or another, we're going to be missing the point. Right. This happens with meta meditation. It happens with noting meditation. It happens with choiceless awareness meditations and all of those kind of things because they don't focus on the Eightfold Noble Path. So if we start focusing on the Eightfold Noble Path, we can look at the Eightfold Noble Path in this way of dividing it into three groups. And the three groups are uh let us say for the beginner for the beginner they have a an eightfold noble path it's not the same as that for the noble in the beginning the path is sila samati panya you probably heard it in that order yeah okay sila samati panya for the beginner can be misunderstood to where you have to be perfect sila for a long period of time before you can get to the next step uh and that i i know of certain um cults and organizations who practice that way when are we ever going to practice meditation you're not good enough to practice meditation <laughs> okay and the reality is, is that seclusion, because you know the Buddha was really big on seclusion. Seclusion enough itself is sila enough itself. Right. If you're not around other people, you're not going to be able to do any of those things that are in the precepts. If there's nobody around, you can't kill anybody. If there's nothing around to steal, then you can't steal anything. If there's nothing to drink, then you don't get drunk. <laughs> if there's nothing to grab hold of, then you don't do much grabbing. 
If there's nobody to lie to, then you don't do much lying. And so just getting into seclusion is enough to start the path, the Eightfold Noble Path. All right. But in the noble sense, we don't start with sila. But in the noble sense, the sila is the natural outcome of a unified, collected, noble mind. But we have to give kids rules. We can't just say, oh, kid, you're smart enough to figure out where to dump and what to do and all of that, because we as children, we're not wise enough. So we need the rules from the beginning. A, a, a silly uh, example of that would be an ice cube. How can you get an ice cube? Well, the water will not turn when it freezes into an ice cube. You need a little box or a cup or something for the to give the uh, uh, the water shape so that when it does harden, it's hardened into that particular shape. So this is the value of the sila from the beginning. But it's not noble, it's ordinary, it's a rule. And it, uh, in the noble sense, we have to come out of the rules and keep our form without needing those kind of boundaries to keep us in shape, that we can do that all on our own. In fact, our, our coolness, as it were, will help us keep our shape. So with that as, a, as an understanding with that, we can then say, well, how then do we apply the Eightfold Noble Path into Anapanasati? And that's where the answer to your question lies. All right. And so we look at it from that. And uh, in the Eightfold Noble Path, the right ability to look and to view as opposed to ordinary right view and wrong view are concepts, they're viewpoints. Um, the, the wrong view is, oh, I can go do anything that I want to and get away with it. I go kill cows over there and I can go kill cows over here and there's no common machine that's going to get me. And then ordinary right view comes in and says, oh, no, if the common machine won't get you, we will. Well, we're going to make sure that you don't get away with it. And if our armies and our cops and our uncles and our grandpas and all and your teachers and all of that kind of stuff can't make you get straightened out, we're going to go get a priest. But we're going to make sure that you're not going to get away with it. So this is ordinary uh, thought. But we're changing that automatically to a noble thought immediately. That we're not going to stay in the ordinary. We're going to immediately go into the noble with the understanding that we can look at what's going on and see it clearly. And so this is the Eightfold Noble Path starts with, and in fact, the whole show has to do with, can you look at what's going on and see it clearly, as opposed to having your eyes full of the mud from the past? that we have narrow, narrow vision because we have been wearing blinders since childhood. Let's take those blinders off and start looking at really what's going on inside the mind. So that actually then equates directly with step nine of Anapanasati, which is the first item on the list of chitta. You know, it goes from uh, Kaya Nupasana, Vedana Nupasana, Chitta Nupasana, and Dhamma Nupasana. So this item number nine is the first item of the mind uh, for, for the beginner is to look at what the mind is doing. The second one then would be step 10 of gladdening the mind. So those are the first two things that we're going to inspect the mind, figure out what it's doing, and then gladden it. The next thing that we're going to be doing, in fact, with that is right effort. So now we have both right view and right effort. And the only question to ask is, when do we do this? And the answer to that is the next one, whenever we remember. Whenever we remember is the sati, and we remember then to take the right effort to gladden the mind. 
So with gladdening the mind and, re and remembering to inspect the mind, the next item on the list is the mindfully breathing in long and mindfully breathing out long or mindfully breathing in short and mindfully breathing out short. But the short breathing has to be different than normal breathing. That that's one of the ways that we can start looking at it is that there is normal breathing, which is mindless. We don't have to remember or think about it or do anything. You don't die in your sleep because you forgot to breathe. That there is some automatic mechanism that'll do that. And not only that, but the automatic mechanism um, has conditions to it. For instance, when you're running up a hill or up stairs, you start to breathe hard because the body requires that. You don't have to think about it. In fact, most people, when they think about their breathing, they want it to stop the long, strong breathing. Let me catch my breath is what people will say, which means let me now stop it <laughs> and take control over it because I don't like what automatic is doing. But at the other end of the scale, when there's uh, when we are afraid and we freeze, now the, sh the breathing gets really, really shallow. But what we're talking about here is whether the breathing is shallow or um, long and heavy, it's still on automatic pilot. And what we're wanting to do here with Anapanasati is make it consciously under your control. We have to take control. We have to mindfully breathe in long. We have to remember to breathe in long. We have to remember to breathe out long. We have to, even if we're breathing short, to remember that this is a short breath and that we're breathing in short and breathing out short. Now, uh, in the suttas, this short breath was never quite understood, and there's many different varieties of how to do the breathing short, and I would say that offhand, all of them are correct, so long as just mindfully breathing short. That's the point. So it can be very, very rapid. We can go <laughs> and mindfully do that because that actually takes effort. This is a good training practice. Uh, um, um, my good friend uh, Achan uh, Dhammavitu in his advanced classes actually teaches that kind of breathing and gets the students into doing it. How long can you keep doing that? <laughs> See, you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and so then you can mindfully stop. But look at the effect of the body now. Now the body is completely energized. You mm. feel vibrantly alive. You feel really, really up. Mm. Okay, so this is of actual practice that's done, but we have to do it mindfully. In fact, we can get lightheaded doing that. Lightheaded means that we're really, really sharp. So um, this is actually then the third option that we would add is mindfulness of the breathing. Because as we're doing that, we begin to become automatically knowledgeable of the body breathing. Especially if we're paying attention to that, that like in the Goenka system of the body scan, but that's still a very formal way of doing it. A more or less formal way of doing it is actually listed in the Satipatthana Sutta in the sense of watch your movements of your hands. Stretching, reaching, grasping, holding, releasing, all of that. Begin to work with that with the body so that you begin to know the body. And also in that regard, what we're going to know is the tensions so that we can release the tensions also. So knowledge of the body is actually all together in that one group of Kaya Nupasana that we can hand the students as one package. And that is mindfully breathing. Mindfully breathing in long and out long, or mindfully breathing in short or out short, either one will give you a knowledge of the body 
and the knowledge of relaxation. Now, the important point about relaxation that is step four of the Anapanasati is, is that only in some of the suttas uh, in the description of the jhana does the body's relaxation come into play. It's almost like that when the mind gets into first jhana, the body is naturally going to relax. So your the relaxation of the body with the uh, mindfulness of the breathing is going to be a result rather than actual skill. But in the Anapanasati Sutta, it's actually listed as a skill to be developed. But I would say that that skill of relaxing the body is um, it's not quite as important as the others. Okay. That the first one, the really important one, because we're looking down to, to six, okay? Yeah. All right, so we're looking at the six. We've already got three of them. And that is my, watching what the mind is doing, gladdening the mind, and watching the body breathe. Right. So those are the three of them. The next ones with that gladdening of the mind and getting in touch with the body, especially if you do some of this short breathing, or we can actually get the body energized with the long breathing so that we feel energized. And to now we're going in the direction of the Vedana, looking at step five and six. And that's and step six then would be the next item on the list, which would be uh, sukha, to develop sukha. Now we can develop sukha through looking at the actual definitions in the Pali of what sukha actually means or the constituent components. And we also understand that sukha is exactly opposite of dukkha. That if we can get ourselves into a state of dukkha, we're already solved the problem. The, the whole teaching of the Buddha is dukkha, dukkha naroda, coming out of dukkha into a state of sukha. And how are we going to do that? Can we just manufacture sukha? No. But what we can do is we can see what's in the mind that keeps us out of it and change that and work with the breathing to get the body relaxed and to get the body um, uh, energized. And then we can work with the sukha mostly through the gladdening of the mind. In other words, we can gladden the mind by recognition that there is nothing dangerous here. We can feel safe right now, even though we don't want to feel safe because we're not in the habit of feeling safe. But in this practice, we can actually practice feeling safe by talking ourselves into it. Actually, almost humorously, we can make it a little joke. Look, Joe, you do not have any poisonous snakes in your pants? Well, that one is not poisonous. <laughs> it may be dangerous, but the whole point <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is that there is there is uh, there are no dangers. Right. There are no spiders in your headphones. Right. There are no boogeymen in the closet. There is no bear in the uh, wardrobe chest. So we can think about that and just actually come to the conclusion that right now it's okay to feel safe. Anything that I can do to make myself feel safe is not actually right here right now. It's in the past or it's in the future. There's some work to be done. I've got to go see the landlord. I've got to go see the boss and all of that. And when we think about it in advance, those are what gives us feelings of danger and we don't feel safe and comfortable and secure and relaxed. So by gladdening the mind, by gladdening the mind, we're actually now going to talk ourselves into feeling safe and secure and comfortable and satisfied. And when we get in ourselves into a state of satisfaction, we have actually now done the skill development that we needed to do to bring on a state of sukha, a state of satisfaction. All right, so what is that? That's one, two, three, number four, is getting into a state of satisfaction. Along with that would be doing this over 
and over and over again. Do what? The, the three things that we've talked about in the April Noble Path so far has been right investigation, right remembering to do the investigation, and right uh, effort to change. Okay, so we're changing the what's in the mind, we're gladdening the mind, we're also focusing the mind on the body and breathing and developing mindfulness there. And so this is the little group that we're getting together and then Sukha comes along as uh, one of the skills that we're beginning to develop by developing the constituent components of it, which would be feelings of safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied. When we add to now the fourth element of the Eightfold Noble Path, most people don't think of the Eightfold Noble Path. They just kind of bunch it all together and say, yep, this is the whole show, without recognizing that no, each one of these elements has its own value if we practice it correctly. And so now the fourth element, which you've heard me talk about, is Sama Sankapa, which is the right attitude. The right attitude is developed through that feeling of satisfaction. In other words, we keep uh, coming back to satisfaction, keep coming back to satisfaction until we develop the attitude of I can feel satisfied. I can do this. That's where the attitude changes, the attitude coming out of being a victim into the attitude of being a winner. In Anapanasati, this is step five, and it's referred to in the Pali term of pity, which almost no one understands the correct definition of, and we wind up with really ridiculous things like rapture, or bliss, or something highfalutin, to where no, what it really means is confidence. I've got this. I can do this. What, what about joy? Do you think well, that's too highfalutin, or...? No, what I mean, if you've got satisfaction, safe, secure, satisfaction and success and the knowledge of success, that's the constituent components of joy right there. OK, then, in fact, gladdening the mind is building joy. So uh, the joy that we're uh, that we're uh, developing uh, this right along with those things. Uh, and that um, I've, I've actually changed it from uh, talking about joy into talking about into, uh, satisfaction because a lot of students will come back and say, yeah, I've been practicing joy and I've got some joy, but it's not enough joy and I want more joy. Well, that means that even though they've got joy, they're still not satisfied. They're wanting more. So what we really need to do is develop the satisfaction where we can be satisfied with the joy that we do have. Right. The joy that comes from comfort, safety, and security, and that satisfaction. And the success that piles on top. Because when we've got success, that's when real joy comes up. Um, the example would be, what does a guy do when he makes a touchdown at the Super Bowl? What's the first thing? Within the net first five seconds of the touchdown, what does the guy who made the touchdown do? Uh, I, I don't know. Jumps around, I guess. <laughs> he jumps around with joy. He right. celebrates, right? Yeah. They throw their arms in the air and the whole rest of the team will come jump on them out of joy have a big pile. Sometimes they'll spike the ball out of joy, right? That's the whole point about success. How many people actually get a great big success that they've been working on for a long time and immediately feel bad because they didn't do it well enough? Yeah, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we need to then give ourselves credit <clears throat> for being successful. And the credit for being successful is the feeling of joy, the feeling of satisfaction, the feeling of success. The feeling of success is very related to the feeling of joy. 
Very few people feel like a failure and joyful at the same time. In fact, when you're talking somebody out of the funk that they have when they're feeling a failure is to talk to them about their successes and tell them that they can do it and then they'll lighten up, they'll joy up. Right. All right. So you can see how deeply, deeply related these these uh, concepts are. Uh, and so that feeling of success is part of the practice. And that feeling of success, we want to remember and continue to do that, to make it part of the practice, that you can remember to lighten up and to feel like You've got this handle. Doesn't matter what the problem is. You've got it wired. Doesn't matter. You 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 can do this. So that's the feeling of the attitude. And there's something else along with that that we can add to it. That when the sati becomes good, that means that you keep applying it and keep applying it and keep applying it, and keep applying it. And so this is what we mean by the application of the mind, even though that's not actually part of the um, Anapanasati Sutta itself. It's definitely uh, listed as part of the requirements for first jhana to apply the mind, remember to apply the mind over and over again to the wholesome, to remember to gladden the mind, to remember to take the deep breath, to remember to feel safe, secure, comfortable, satisfied, and successful. Okay. And then once we can get ourselves into that state, we want to sustain it. So this is what we mean by the applied and sustained thought, which means that if a hindrance comes back, catch it quickly, throw it out, and let's maintain the state of joyful success. Okay, so how many items do we have now? Is that, we is have, that five? Or? Well, we have the, the uh, to look at what the mind is doing, to gladden the mind, to uh, to breathe well, develop the sukha, develop the pity, and then develop the mind further to sustain it. Okay. Now, what that means is that the mind is really, truly now fit for work. We have things to do now with that, but this is the first part of it is get the mind fit for work. And in a way, we have been dealing with the Dhamma Nupasana, uh, but not in the way that we would expect, in the sense that the Dhamma Nupasana that's described in the Satipatthana Sutta talks about it in this order of this list. Number one is the hindrances and remove them. The second one is uh, to look at the five aggregates. The next one is to look at the Sambhojana, the seven factors of enlightenment, and then the actual last item on the list is often the Four Noble Truths. That in fact, there are two suttas. One is the Mahasatipatthana, and the other one is the Satipatthana. And the main difference between these two is the last section that in the Mahasatipatthana, there's a long, long discourse on the Four Noble Truths that does not exist in the shorter version of it. So what we're saying in this regard, these are the, uh, the kinds of objects that we can have in the mind that we would want to have in the mind in the sense of we either have hindrances, which is all over the place, or we can begin to focus the mind on Dhamma. And that's in the Satipatthana, the Dhamma of what? To see the five aggregates as not self. This is not me. This is not who I am. I am not the body. I am not these feelings. I am, when I, when ordinary people say, I am frustrated, that's ignorant. They're adding a self to it. That what we're going to see instead is, Instead of I am frustrated, we can say, aha, I see that frustration. I see the hindrance. I am not the hindrance. I am there not frustration. There is just frustration there. And at best, I'm a witness to it or I'm the observer of it. Later, we even understand that I am not the observer either. There's just merely observation without an observer. And there is frustrations without a frustrator or a frustrating. There's just frustration and just observation, and there's no self there. 
Okay, and we can begin to see that kind of stuff by paying close attention to it. Now, let's go to the other side of it, the way that this is described in the Anapanasati Sutra, because a lot of people will get confused because it says that the, uh, sati, that the Anapanasati is for the fulfillment of the uh, Satipatthana. Why is it that there is such great divergence? They don't look alike at all. To where, in fact, they do, because now what we're going to be looking for has to do with what condition the mind is in, because we have to have the mind that's free from hindrances. Once we have the mind free from hindrances, now we can start watching the things that are there that are not unwholesome. And so we're going to start watching the very things that we've been doing in the sense of how's my sati? How is the um, um, investigation? How is the breathing? In other words, we're going to now go back and look at the real things that have to do with how did we get ourselves into the first jhana or what are the jhana factors? And we're going to sustain this first jhana by looking at the constituent components. And every time that I change from one component to another, the awareness changes. And so we are, are actually practicing correctly, both of them at the same time, the arising and the passing away of the um, Anapanasati's version of it, plus the um, changing from the unwholesome into the wholesome, which is re represent the Satipatthana Sutta. Okay, but this is what we're going to be doing after the mind is fit for work. Investigate the jhana factors. Investigate the jhana factors. And one of these jhana factors that we will investigate is, in fact, how is my applying of the wholesome? How is my sustaining of the wholesome? And how good do I feel with this? And pretty soon when we start inspecting how good I feel about it, we don't have to think anymore. When you're really, really feeling good, we don't have to think about feeling good. We're just experiencing feeling good. Really, really feeling good requires no thought. This right. is second, John, is that when we start investigating how good we feel, we don't need these applied and sustained wholesome thoughts anymore. We can put some gaps in there. So this is a little bit further practice after we get developed, but the beginner has to start with only a few factors. Eventually, we'll add all of them to it, but we could look at there's things to do with the body, there's things to do with feelings, there's things to do with the mind, and there's things to do with the mind object for the beginner. And then there are things to do with the body, things to do with the, uh, the feelings, things to do with the mind, and things to do with the mind's objects for the more advanced student, the one who now can get himself into first jhana. But for the beginner, all we need is this little group of the things that are actually on the Eightfold Noble Path, is to wake up, look at what you're doing, make a change, and congratulate yourself for making that change. And these are the four of them in Apply Down Upon Asati. That's step nine, step 10, step one and two, Step five and step six. Nine, ten, one and two, five and six. That's five items. Okay. So does that answer your question? Yeah. That, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but there are people who try to practice them in order. Oh, we're going to be doing step four now. We've been doing step three for six months, and now we're going to be doing step four. And then, in fact, you can see that uh, in the Goenka retreat, that they spend seven days focusing on step three right, of experiencing the body, the body experiencing yeah. the body, experiencing the body, and not recognizing that you've got a whole lot of other stuff to do while you're doing that. That we don't just focus on just one little thing. I mean, I, I know some Goenka practitioners and they've been spending like 20 years uh, on the body <laughs> and haven't, haven't moved on to, on to anything else. There's no Vedana or uh, Chitta. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Right. Well, that's because they're doing it the formal way and thinking that they have to get step one finished before they do step two. Yeah. This is, in fact, we can see that that happens in school. A clear example of that is, in fact, I've seen some Internet stuff uh, on YouTube to where they can teach calculus to third graders. Why do we have to wait until the 10th or 11th grade or even college to get any calculus when, in fact, if you teach the kids the concepts of it, all you really have to do is give a kid a ball, a circle, and tell him to start cutting it up. And the next thing you know, he's a cut up. He's calculating. All right. But we don't see it. We say, no, you've got to do all of this mathematics and all of this arithmetic and get really, really great at arithmetic before we're even going to add any algebra. Right. That's not the right way to teach. A more natural way to teach is the things that you need to know, we're going to teach them as a group all together. And so this six or five or six items is something that every beginning student needs to do. So do the do the last four steps, do they like arise naturally, like the letting go and, and all of this? uh the seeing impermanence or like does it arise nat naturally as a result of like investigating the genre factors or um as we continue developing the uh the taking objects that are wholesome because we've already eliminated all of the unwholesome thoughts what we begin to do is to go let us say um into a mental one's own mind uh, examination of how the mind works, which is Paticca Samuppada. All right, so we're gaining the skills to do that. And the skill that we begin at is that point of feeling. Can we actually change the way that we feel? And that uh, as we begin to see that, all that means that we only feel what we are contacted to feel. In other words, you, we're already in the habit, so when a particular kind of contact happens, we have a particular kind of feeling because that's the habit that we're in. So we begin now to change the kind of thoughts that we have. All right, We don't have to have thoughts that wind us up feeling bad. Then we recognize earlier than that, that our thoughts are based upon the past. If we would stop with all of this processing and trying to make sense out of things and just allow our sensory input from the eyes, the ears and the body and all of that and just be in reality without making sense of reality. Is because our feelings come not from the reality itself, but the sense that we've made out of it. So when we stop making sense out of reality and just experience that which is, then we are not subject to these bad feelings. This is what we mean. Uh, there's a sutta, by the way, that describes this, that when Sariputta brings perception to an end, it brings feelings to an end. And that's all there is to the practice, is learn to stop trying to make sense out of things. And Which sutta is that? Uh, sutta number 111. Okay. One by one as one they by occur. One. Yeah. Okay. The one by one as they occur, the first thing that Sariputta does is remove the hindrances. They're gone. One by one as they occur is not, not hindrances. The one by one as they occur are all wholesome things. Right. OK, and what is wholesome? Applying the mind, sustaining the mind, gladdening the mind, investigating the mind, relaxing the body, you see. So that's the whole idea of it right there. And when we're doing those things, now we can begin to see that everything is temporary. Everything is arising and passing away. When I'm looking at the applied thought, I'm not looking at sustained. When I'm looking at the feeling of pity, I'm not looking at the feeling of uh, this, that, or the other thing. The mind can only do one thing at a time. Okay. This is why that sutta is referenced as one by one as they occur. And so we're going to actually take these objects one by one 
and investigate them. And as we do in that order, it winds us up in Fort Jana because we're taking one I, I, a wholesome object after another. So the first object that we take once the mind is fit for work uh, is to see how we can keep applying it to the wholesome, keep applying it to the uh, and sustaining that and, and keeping that going. Once we've got it on a roll and we've got one thought after another, this wholesome, we feel so good that we're not worried about what kind of thinking we have anymore. We're more interested in how good I feel. And so that is taken as the object of the second jhana, is how good do we feel? But that, how good we feel, how great can we feel, is actually kind of a lot of work. And when we take that work out of it, then we just relax into feeling good in, in the third jhana. And then we relax even more. And we can relax now into actually seeing how the mind works. So these are actual objects. If you go read that sutta after this, after I've spoken to you about it, you can say, oh, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly what that sutta is saying. But we got to get the mind fit for work first in order to pay attention to these very wholesome objects. And by paying attention to them one after another, we're actually paying attention to how the mind itself works. Okay. Because we're taking mental objects and examining. We're examining the thinking. We're examining the feelings. We're examining uh, the really great big feelings. We're examining the middle size. And now we're examining the little feelings. And eventually, because of no perception and no making sense out of it at all, we could dispense with feelings and just come into a state of what they call equanimity or just... Uh, <laughs> so did that answer that question for you yeah good so is it all ties together but it does in a, an informal easy to practice concept or way of looking at it but when it's introduced in such a formal way, the way that it is in the suttas, it seems overly complex, way too much to do, way beyond your capabilities. This is why we want to bring it down to just a few things to get started. Just five or six little things. Yeah, it makes sense. So do you have any other questions? Um. No, I don't think so. All right. Great. Yeah. All right. So you know how to practice now. <laughs> yeah. Good reminders. <laughs> Excellent. So you already knew the answer to that question anyway. To what question? The first one. Wh which which question? Oh, the first question I asked you. Yeah. How many? Well, I wanted to hear your explanation of it, though, because it's, you know, I read Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa's uh, explanation of it. And so I, I wanted to hear hear you, you know. OK, what did Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa have to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it I mean, it's, it pretty much li lined up like that. I mean, he kind of narrowed it down even more than that, where he was like at one point he was like, if that's just too complex. <laughs> Uh, then just go with uh, get your mind in a state of samadhi and then take that state of samadhi and direct it to Anicca, uh, Dukkha, Anatta. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, because he it was in this book uh, called Vipassana for Everyone. Uh, or, or yeah, I think something like that. Or, no, Vipassana, a shortcut. And uh, he was talking about a shortcut method. And yeah, so it, li it lines up with what he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured it. It would. I got yeah. all of this stuff from him anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it it does, but like because his is translated from somebody else, yours is often more clear because like the translator obviously you know they're they're not perfect because he's speaking Thai, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and you use more like colloquial language that is you know easier to understand sometimes. So, yeah. Right. Glad yeah. To hear it. <laughs> All right. Thank okay, you so much. Joe. Yeah. All right. Have a Joe. nice day. Yeah. We'll see really you later. Appreciate it. Bye. Uh huh. Bye bye.